Matthew Andrews of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill talks about how the racial tensions of the 1980s were reflected in the sports of the era, particularly when white and black athletes faced off in boxing matches and basketball games. He argues that athletes became symbols around which conversations and disagreements over racial issues took place. His class is about an hour and ten minutes. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we've been exploring the question of gender and uh, women's rights in, in sports. Today we're going to return our focus to race relations and questions of race in American sports and American sports history. Specifically, we're going to explore what I like to call the return of the great white hope in the 1980s. Uh, you know all about the original great white hope. You did research on the original great white hope. Jim Jeffries, in 1910, he comes out of retirement. He tries to redeem the white race and defeat Jack Johnson in the ring in Reno. You know that he was unsuccessful. He failed. Well, in the 1980s, there emerged a few white athletes who were thought of somewhat in the same way. These were white athletes that white Americans hoped would score symbolic victories in sports. And the attitudes towards these athletes suggested that perhaps the nation had not come as far as many people like to think with regards to race. Perhaps racial issues had not gone away. Um, the United States may have entered what commentators were calling the post-civil rights era, the 1970s, the 1980s. This is the post-civil rights era. But clearly, race was still meaningful. Clearly, racial anxieties still existed. And so to illustrate these anxieties, um, I'm, I'm going to explore these anxieties in a few minutes. We're going to explain where these anxieties come from. But to illustrate these anxieties, I'm going to begin with a story, with a sports story. You all know how much I like boxing and prize fighting, so I have one more prize fighting story to tell you. Don't worry, it's the last one. It's the last one all semester. Um, so, so savor the experience. All right, here we go. I'm going to tell you about the 1982 fight, heavyweight fight, between Larry Holmes and Jerry Cooney, the fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. This ended up being boxing's last great black versus white fight of the 20th century. And the fight thankfully lacked the murderous racial hysterics of the Johnson Jeffries fight of 1910. You know that Americans actually died because of this fight. But like the Johnson Jeffries fight of 1910, this was both a sporting event and it was a racial drama, a serious and compelling and intense racial drama. All right, Larry Holmes was the champion. Holmes was a tremendous heavyweight champion, uh, but Holmes was the victim of bad timing. Uh, Holmes is the first great champion right after Muhammad Ali, and you know all about Muhammad Ali. And in fact, Holmes defeated an older and out of shape Ali in 1980, but Holmes never got the credit that I think he deserved. And that's because he just wasn't as charismatic as Muhammad Ali. I mean, who was as charismatic as Muhammad Ali? That said, Holmes was a great fighter. He was a skilled boxer. He had very fast hands. And he was a big man with a hard, heavy punch. He had a serious knockout blow. And when he fought Jerry Cooney in 1982, he was undefeated. He was 39 and 0. Cooney was the challenger. He was an Irish-American from New York. Cooney rises through the boxing ranks, and he becomes popular and famous for two main reasons. One, like Holmes, he's a tremendous puncher. He hits very, very hard. He ended many of his fights with early knockouts. But second, and there are no two ways about this, Jerry Cooney is popular because he is white. That has a ton to do with his immense popularity. After decades of heavyweight boxing being dominated by black fighters and black champions, and I'll just give you some of the names. You know these names. Floyd Patterson, Sonny Liston, Muhammad Ali, 
And now, um, Larry Holmes, here was a white possibility. And as many Americans saw it, here was a great white hope, a white American who might reclaim the heavyweight title. So this fight takes place in June of 1982. Um, I'll get to the fight in just a second, but there's an interesting coincidence going on in the summer of 1982. There is a big blockbuster movie uh, in the theaters, Rocky III. And we have not talked about Rocky yet, so we need to take a step back. We need to intellectualize Rocky Balboa a little bit. Let's talk a little Rocky, and I'll get Rocky up there on the, on the screen. Any Rocky fans out there? People seen these movies? People still see Rocky movies? Okay. The first two Rocky movies, Rocky I and Rocky II, these are films in which a white Italian-American boxer fights a cocky, flashy, brash, black heavyweight champion, Apollo Creed. I'm going to ruin the endings uh, for both of these, these films. Rocky is a heavy underdog in the first film. He loses in the first film. He loses in a split decision to Apollo Creed. No one thinks he's going to do well. He does remarkably well, but he does not win. In Rocky II, he knocks out Apollo Creed in the most implausible boxing scene ever filmed. Um, it's absolutely impossible what, what happens. But Rocky wins. These were both very popular movies in 1976 and 1979, but these are much more than just sports movies. These are movies about race. These are movies about American history. Though fictional characters, Rocky Balboa and Apollo Creed are meant to signify and represent real fighters. Apollo Creed is Muhammad Ali. There's no doubt about it. He is brash. He is cocky, he's the heavyweight champion, he is black. Creed is Ali. Rocky Balboa is a combination of a couple fighters, I think. First of all, he's Rocky Marciano, right? I mean, same name, Rocky Balboa, Rocky Marciano. From the perspective of the 1980s, Marciano was the last white heavyweight champion, last white American heavyweight champion, I ought to say. Marciano was 49-0 and 0 over his career. He was the heavyweight champion from 1952 to 1956. Never lost a bout, the only heavyweight who, who can claim this. When Muhammad Ali was dominating boxing in the 60s and 70s, there were always, the, always those who said, yeah, well, he can't beat Rocky Marciano. Rocky Marciano would beat Ali. We get Rocky Marciano versus Ali in these Rocky movies. The other fighter that Balboa is, is Joe Frazier. And you know a lot about Joe Frazier. We watched a documentary about Joe Frazier. Rocky Balboa is from Philadelphia. Joe Frazier is from Philadelphia. Rocky, in the movie, trains by punching slabs of beef in a slaughterhouse. Joe Frazier, as he was rising through the boxing ranks, worked in these slaughterhouses. We watched the Frazier Ali documentary. We got a sense of how badly white Americans wanted Frazier to beat Ali. We got a sense that Frazier was their hope against Muhammad Ali. And so one way of reading the Rocky movies, the first two in particular, the first three, and this is the way I read the Rocky movies, is to say that Rocky is white America's revenge fantasy against Muhammad Ali. Couldn't beat him in the ring, uh, so a fictional character is going to do it for us. And here is Rocky taking it to Apollo um, Marciano taking it to Ali. There are different ways of thinking about this. So, these Rocky movies exist. The Holmes-Cooney fight takes place at the same time as Rocky III. When Rocky fights an even more brash black fighter, he fights a super menacing heavyweight played brilliantly by Mr. T. And here's what's so interesting about this moment. Fight promoters worked very, very hard to link Jerry Cooney with Rocky Balboa, as if Jerry Cooney were Rocky Balboa. Here's the cover of Time Magazine from June of 1982. Who's on the cover of Time Magazine? Jerry Cooney and Rocky Balboa, two great white hopes sharing the cover of the nation's most important news magazine. 
even though Holmes was the champion, even though Holmes was 39-0, and this fight was all about Cooney. This fight was all about the white challenger. Just in case the public didn't really understand what was going on here, just in case the public didn't realize that this was about race, the promoter of the fight, a man named Don King, uh, a man about as subtle as his hair, uh, he put it this way, spelled it out nice and plain, this is a black and white fight. This is about race. Cooney was very clear. He said, this has nothing to do with race. I'm not fighting Holmes to redeem the white race. It's not what this, is a, what this fight is about. But promoters talked about race every chance they could. They knew that this would sell tickets. This would sell interest. Larry Holmes got so tired of all the talk of race, all the talk about Cooney being this great white hope. He was being interviewed at a press conference. He snapped. He said, Jerry Cooney is the great white hoax. Um, I'm better than he is. The only reason why he's here is because he is white. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. All right. The fight takes place in Las Vegas, Nevada, June 11th, 1982. 32,000 paying spectators. Millions more are watching at home on pay-per-view. I was one of those millions. I'm going to tell you something about that in just, just a second. Here are some interesting facts from this night and this fight. Interesting fact number one. The Las Vegas Police Department employed their SWAT team. They surrounded the arena up on the roof. Snipers were pointing their guns at the crowd as the crowd went in, and that's because there were death threats um, revolving around this fight. Members of the Ku Klux Klan had said that if Holmes wins this fight, they were going to assassinate him in the ring. Black militant organizations said, we're sending members, we're going to be armed. If any harm is done to Larry Holmes, we're going to do something to Cooney. We're going to fight back. I mean, this is much more than a sporting event, right? We have an intense racial drama playing out in Las Vegas. Interesting fact number two. Jerry Cooney's dressing room was equipped with an outside phone line, so if he won, the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, could call him and congratulate him on the victory. There was no such phone line in Larry Holmes's dressing room. The President was not interested in congratulating Holmes if he won. Interesting fact number three, once both fighters were in the ring, the ring announcer introduced Larry Holmes first. It was a long-standing tradition in boxing that the champion was introduced second. The champion was always introduced last. That was a position of honor. For some reason, Cooney was given that honor. He was introduced second. I cannot remember it happening before this bout. I cannot remember it happening since. Holmes was disrespected in the ring. The two fighters, they come together for their instructions. The referee gives them their instructions. When they are done, the two fighters touch gloves. And despite all of the racial talk out there, all of the racial anxiety swirling around this fight, Larry Holmes says to Jerry Cooney, let's have a good fight. And I remember being at home. I remember hearing Larry Holmes saying that. And that was the exact moment that I became a Larry Holmes fan. And... This course is not about me, but let me say something about this, this fight. It's not about me, right? No, this course is not about I hope not. Um, at the beginning of 1982, early June of 1982, I was 13 years old. And I was a huge sports fan. I, was I mean, my, we've been looking at these Sports Illustrated covers. My bedroom walls were covered in Sports Illustrated covers, sports posters. I was very excited about all sports, very excited about boxing. I was getting very excited about this fight. Um, I knew about Larry Holmes, of course. I knew very little about Jerry Cooney. I just heard of him about two months earlier. But I remember as this fight cl got closer, very badly wanting Jerry Cooney to beat Larry Holmes. You know, I wanted Cooney to win. I grew up in a mostly white neighborhood. I went to mostly white schools. All of my friends were white. I was reading the sports page. I was reading Sports Illustrated. I was reading Time Magazine. And the messages that I was getting from these 
publications was that white people, <clears throat> excuse me, want Cooney to win and black people want Larry Holmes to, to win. Those were the messages. That's what I was learning. I was neither smart enough to know what was going on, nor did I have enough self-confidence to be able to break away from these messages, but I bought it. I, I, I took the bait. I mean, I started thinking that Cooney somehow represented me. This is the way ideas about race operate in this country. This is how racism operates in this country. You unthinkingly align yourself with someone because they happen to share the same pigmentation that, that you do. Um, I bought it. I was rooting for Cooney. And then Larry Holmes says, let's have a good fight. And all of a sudden, I felt like a heel. Not a Tar Heel. Tar Heel's good. Um, I, felt like a, I felt like a dope. Um, a great white dope, um, I guess, is the way to, way to think about it. Um, you read a book about Ali. Malcolm X was in that book. Ali said Americans have been bamboozled to think in terms of an us-against-them mentality, a black versus white mentality. I, I, I bought it. Um, I like to think I don't do that now, but this is the way that ideas about race are transmuted in in sports. Very interesting moment, I think, in, in um, thinking back at it. Anyway, uh, Larry Holmes says, let's have a good fight. It was a very good fight. Um, Holmes came out. He was fighting hard. He was fighting viciously. He knocked Cooney down uh, in the second round with a one-two combination, right? That is left-handed jab, right-handed cross. Cooney was knocked down in the second round. Somehow he managed to get back up. He made it through the second round. And then Cooney fought what most people consider to be the greatest fight of his career. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Larry Holmes into the late rounds. Um, but Holmes was just better. Holmes was a skilled boxer and a slugger. Cooney was really just a slugger. By the 12th round, Cooney was so tired, his arms were tired, he couldn't get his punches up anymore. On two different occasions, he hit Larry Holmes right in the groin, I mean, right below the, the belt. Here's one of those moments. Larry Holmes was doubled over in pain. Cooney had points deducted from his score. Um, there was actually, after the second hit, there was a break in the action so Holmes could recover. Time was stopped. Holmes went to his corner. He sat down. His trainer reached both hands into his pants and started vigorously massaging his genitals. It's like, we've got to get you right again. I tell you, watching this on TV, I became a man that night, um, with, <laughs> without a doubt. Uh, finally... <laughs> In the 13th round, Holmes knocks Cooney down. Cooney falls. He, he struggles. He tries to get up, but he was totally out of it. He was dazed and confused. His trainers throw in the towel. Larry Holmes remains the heavyweight champion of the world. 13th round, technical knockout. Jerry Cooney was a decent fighter. Right? Jerry Cooney was not a complete hoax. But so much of his popularity, I mean, so much of the reason for his fame was because of white hope and, and white hype. I mean, I think Larry Holmes was right when he, he said that. So this is the opening story to kind of get us into the 1980s. Do you want to ask a question about this, this fight or make a comment? Completely lose his popularity after the fight. Cooney, yeah, yeah Cooney more. Cooney fights a few more times. Cooney fades into ob obscurity. I mean, there's a kind of a like with the with the Joe Lewis Max Schmeling story. There's a nice ending to this story. Holmes and Cooney actually became very good good friends later on once they were able to kind of move beyond this this episode. But um, he was exposed for not being as good of a fighter as so many people had hoped. And boxing wise, he fades into obscurity. Yeah. That certainly never gets a chance to fight for the title again. Yeah? Did anything significant happen, like the night of the fight? Like there, there was, was no violence, um, thankfully, right? So it's not like 1910, 
we don't have uh, you know scores of people getting hurt, scores of people dying when when the black man wins. Um, but just the fact that it's 1982 and there are still anxieties about a race riot happening, it got a lot of people questioning just how far has this country really come with regard to to race. Yes, we've had a civil rights movement. Yes, we've had a black power movement. But have we really moved beyond <laughs> racial an- anxieties? Yeah. What was the public opinion of Larry Holmes? The public opinion of him afterwards, before? Before the fight, um, more of was he kind of a Liston figure? Was he a Patterson figure? No. No, but... Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't put him in either this sort of, quote unquote, good Negro integrationist camp of, 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 of Patterson or, you know, Liston, who was thought many ways of and the opposite. People weren't terribly interested in Larry Holmes, and that's because Larry Holmes was not Muhammad Ali. I mean, Larry Holmes just, you know, couldn't talk in the way Ali could. Again, who, who can, right? We, we, we saw Ali talking. The, the nation just wasn't terribly interested in, in Larry Holmes. Um, so this fight really, in some ways, wasn't about Larry Holmes. I mean, this fight was about Jerry Cooney. This fight was all about the white challenger. Uh, just to kind of continue with the Holmes story, Holmes goes on. He's eventually 48 and 0, um, and then he's fighting, I think it's Michael Spinks, in hopes of becoming 49 and 0 and tying Marciano's record. He lost. Um, he lost that fight, so he was 48 and, and 1. And at the press conference, everyone said, see, you're no Rocky Marciano. And Larry Holmes famously said, Rocky Marciano could not carry my jockstrap. Um, he was tired of all the Rocky Marciano talk. Yeah. Other questions or comments? All right. Let's put this fight into larger historical context, right? What was going on in the United States, perhaps, that caused so many Americans to invest so heavily in Jerry Cooney? This takes us to the story of a white backlash to the civil rights and black power movements. Movements we have discussed. For two decades, the civil rights and black power movements had been gaining steam. Beginning in the 1950s, black Americans start scoring major civil rights victories through the courts, through legislation, through their own protests. Black Americans were dramatically protesting racism. They were, in the late 60s, think Smith and Carlos and their fists, they are dramatically protesting lingering racism in the United States. And here's what happens. By the 1970s, many white Americans began to feel as if they had become the victims of the civil rights and black power movements, that they were being victimized by all of the changes. There was a growing belief among many white Americans that the nation, and specifically the government, the federal government, that, these, that the nation and the government were overly fixated on the problems facing black Americans and were not fairly considering the problems facing white Americans. And there was a very interesting and what I'm going to call unfortunate coincidence in, in timing here. The gains made by the civil rights and black power movements occurred right at the same time as a steep economic downturn in the United States. After three decades of the American economy steadily rising, at the start of the 1970s, the economy slows and the economy begins to digress, regress. This was due to a number of factors, complicated global factors. The cost of the Vietnam War, the rising price of oil in the Middle East, the fact that American companies were now sending jobs overseas. This begins in the late 60s and particularly in the early 1970s. So many white Americans, like all Americans, were feeling a pinch. They were feeling an economic pinch. Wages were lowering in the 1970s. Job opportunities were drying up in the 1970s. Times were not as good as they had been. Rather than look at their declining economic status and blaming these complex global and economic factors, 
What many white Americans did was they blamed people of color. Um, it was almost as if people thought about race as a scale, you know, and as white status seemed to be going down because of these economic factors, white Americans noticed that black Americans, their status will seem to be going up because of the civil rights and the black power movement. And so the idea was, well, it must be their fault. It must be because of them. In the 1970s, then, race became seen in many ways, and this is a good way of putting it, as a zero-sum calculus, and that any gains by blacks were understood as losses by whites, and vice versa. We could just as easily bring gender into this. We could make this not just a white story, but a white man story. As the status of American male workers was falling, it was the same time that the status of American women was rising with Title IX and all of these pieces of legislation that, that we discussed. And many white American men felt on the defensive. Um, they were being attacked. They were the new victims in American society. This is a great example of this, affirmative action. Affirmative action policies were part of this calculus, this zero-sum calculus. Affirmative action begins in the United States in 1965, when federal and state governments begin implementing affirmative action policies. The idea here is that in order to combat the lingering effects of racism, the lingering effects of Jim Crow segregation, different aspects of American society, the government needed to take affirmative action. Schools needed to take affirmative action to let applicants of color in, to try to desegregate schools. The government needed to take affirmative action when handing out contracts, give those contracts to businesses owned by black Americans. Something aggressive, something affirmative needed to be done to even out the racial scales of equality. This is the idea behind affirmative action. Many white Americans saw affirmative action as a total negative. As they saw it, suddenly they were being victimized by the government's policies they were the victims of racism, right? What was known as reverse racism. As this placard suggests, I am a victim of a hate crime, affirmative action. I am being unfairly and unequally treated. So there was a real growing sense of resentment among some white Americans. There was a sense that they were under siege and, then at that, and that black rights were now trumping White rights. And that is the rally cry of the backlash movement. Whites have rights too. Don't forget about us. Now we're the ones who are being treated unfairly. So I'm going to relate this to sports. Um, don't worry, more sports. But do you want to ask a question about this backlash or raise an issue? Did this occur in any specific location of America, like the South, kind of like you see today? Is it more everywhere? That's an excellent question. It is a national phenomenon. In fact, what I, I'm going to be talking about Boston in just a few minutes as the epicenter of the white backlash movement. I mean, we, you know, maybe unfairly come to think that this is going to be mostly a southern phenomenon because of a lot of things, a lot of the things we've been talking about in this class. But it is definitely a national phenomenon. And again, Boston is going to be the place that, that, that we'll focus on in just a second. Other questions? Okay, let's relate this to sports then. Just, here's what happens. Just as black Americans had historically latched on to black athletes, latched onto them as symbols of strength, as symbols of power, as symbols of deliverance in a time of anxiety, in a time of unfairness, white Americans began latching on to white athletes for exactly the same reasons. And in some ways, it makes perfect sense that this would happen in the world of sports because sports were one of the arenas in which black gains were most obvious. Um, I mean, to put it bluntly, the world of sport was becoming blacker as the 1970s 
progressed. African Americans were doing very, very well in the world of sports. And there's one sport in particular in which this is definitely true, the sport that I want to focus on. This is basketball. All right, we've talked a little bit about basketball, college basketball. I'll talk a little more about it. And then we'll focus on, on pro basketball. You know about this moment, right? 1966. The symbolic turning point in basketball, symbolically, moving from a white-dominated sport in the American mind to a black-dominated sport in the American mind came in the 1966 NCAA title game when Texas Western, their all-black starting five, it defeated the University of Kentucky, which was an all-white team. There was a reaction. There was a backlash to this moment. Some tried to undercut the significance of this moment. They tried to explain it away, and it could get very, very ugly. Um, there was a one-time great West Virginia basketball player. Then he played for the Lakers. In 1966, he was an announcer for the Phoenix Suns, Hot Rod Hundley. He said, that Texas Western team can do everything with a basketball except autograph it. All right, they may be good bas- basketball players, but they're dumb. Um, undercutting their accomplishments. The game of college basketball itself changes when Texas Western wins. There are rule changes that are implemented. The coach of Kentucky, of that all-white Kentucky team, was a guy named Adolph Rupp, R-U-P-P, Rupp Arena in Kentucky. His team had been dunked on repeatedly in that 1966 title game, so Adolph Rupp used his influence he got the NCAA to ban dunking in college basketball. Beginning in 1967, dunking was against the rule. You all love the dunk. Everyone loves the dunk. Uh, But in 1967, the dunk was abolished in basketball. Technical foul if you did it. Rupp was one of the reasons why this happened. Another reason was because of the amazing seven-foot to center at UCLA, Lou Alcindor. We talked about him in the context of the 1968 Olympics. Opposing coaches saw Alcindor as unstoppable. He's too good. He is ruining the game. He, all he does is dunk, and we can't stop him. So let's get rid of the dunk. No dunking allowed. Lou Alcindor, who you know is outspoken. Lou Alcindor didn't play for the 1968 Olympic team. Uh, we, we talked about this. Lou Alcindor s- believed, said, there is a racial motivation to this. Um, this is because I am black. Very provocatively, Lou Alcindor said this. The dunk is one of basketball's great crowd pleasers, and there is no good reason to give it up except that this and other niggers were running away with the sport. African Americans are dominating basketball, so now the rules are being changed. Alcindor says, I know why this is going on. This is an anti-black rule change. The NCAA did not reinstate the dunk until 1976, right? So from 67 to 76, no dunking in college basketball. Okay, we've discussed college basketball a lot in this class. We have not discussed pro basketball. Let me tell you a little bit about pro basketball, specifically the National Basketball Association, the NBA. The NBA was established in 1946. It was an all-white league for four years. The NBA is desegregated in 1950 when Earl Lloyd debuts for the Washington Capitals. So in 1950, the NBA was desegregated, right? We've talked about the difference between these terms, desegregation and integration. The NBA was desegregated in 1950. And by the 1970s, the NBA was totally integrated, totally integrated. In fact, the NBA was predominantly black. It was mostly black. Most of the roster spots were taken up by African Americans. Remember, basketball is an urban sport. Basketball was created to fill the sporting needs for urban Americans, the people living in cities, Beginning with the Great Migration during World War I, the northern urban cities were becoming more and more black, increasingly populated with African-American families. Their children played 
basketball. I mean, basketball was becoming an urban, or was an urban, therefore basketball was becoming more and more a black sport. By the 1970s, most of the NBA players were black, and this caused a major public relations problem for the NBA. As you know, and as we have discussed, people like seeing representations of themselves on the field of play, in the sporting arena. And so for many white Americans, so we're talking about sort of the bulk of the paying customers for the NBA at this time, uh, they no longer felt like they were being represented in the NBA. White Americans lost interest in the National Basketball Association. And so here is the indisputable truth about the NBA, and it might be hard to imagine now because the NBA is so popular. In the 1970s, the NBA was not popular. The NBA was a suspect sports league. There was a historian who calls the 1970s the dark ages of the league, and he means that in a couple of ways. It's unpopular. Very few people were actually watching the NBA, actually less and less as the 1970s go on. And then dark is a play on race. The reason why it's unpopular is that the NBA was perceived... I want to emphasize this, perceived as being too black. The NBA had a quote-unquote blackness problem. Here's a chart, an interesting chart. As the percentage of black players goes up in the NBA, as the NBA goes from being about 60% black to 75% black, there is a corresponding dip in TV viewership, right? This chart suggests that the blacker the NBA got, the less popular the NBA got. There's an interesting blip there on the bottom in 1977, right? All of a sudden, wait a minute, there's a resurge in interest in NBA basketball. What accounts for this? Well, if we want to continue with this racial story, what accounts for it is Bill Walton. 1977 was a year dominated by the Portland Trailblazers, dominated by their fabulous, when healthy, he was often hurt, their fabulous white center, Bill Walton. You know, people are tuning in when Walton is excelling. They're not tuning in when it's black players who are excelling. Another factor that helps explain the growing unpopularity of the NBA in the 1970s was fighting. There was a ton of fighting in the NBA, and this has a racial angle as well. The NBA has really cracked down hard on fighting now. I mean, fighting is forbidden uh, in the National Basketball Association. Not so in the 1970s. NBA games in the 1970s were like hockey games. Uh, there were fist fights all the time in NBA basketball games. Every team had an enforcer. They had a guy like Maurice Lucas, you know, big, brave, tough, strong. His job was to physically intimidate the other team. His job was to physically punish the other team's top scorer, to use his fists whenever necessary. We're going to have a fight. You know, Maurice Lucas, you're the guy. Every team had a guy like Maurice Lucas. The, in some ways, the defining moment of the NBA in that entire decade, the 1970s then, it comes in 1977 with what is known simply in NBA lore as the punch. When you say the punch in the NBA, people know exactly what you're talking about. The Houston Rockets were playing at the Los Angeles Lakers in 1977, and there was a fight. There was a fist fight at center court. There were always fights. The Rockets forward, Rudy Tomjanovich, who is white, ran to the middle of the court. He ran toward the, the fight. It was unclear if he was coming to join in the fight or if he was coming to break the fight up. A member of the Lakers, Kermit Washington, who was black, saw Tom Janovich coming in. He turned around and threw a right cross right into Tom Janovich's face. And Rudy Tom Janovich splashed to the ground. And I say he splashed because there was just blood everywhere. Washington had shattered Tom Janovich's jaw, his nose, both of his cheekbones. 
Tomjanovich couldn't breathe. Spinal fluid began dripping into his brain. Um, it, it really looked like Tom Janovich was going to die right there on the forum floor. Tom Janovich didn't die, all right? Tom Janovich stabilized. Um, he returned to the NBA five months later. He was never the same player. He went on to be a successful coach for the Houston Rockets later. Um, but this picture right here, this in some ways was the defining image of the NBA in the 1970s. It was the image of a black man obliterating the face of a white man. And so the NBA was just being criticized on a number of grounds. It was unpopular, particularly among white Americans, for a number of reasons. It was criticized for its style of play. People thought it was, there was a selfish, I got to get mine style of play where individual stats meant more than um, team wins. But more and more Americans were clearly turning away from the NBA because it, as they saw it, the NBA had a violence problem and the NBA had a blackness problem. And I think for a lot of white Americans, they saw those two things as the same thing. Big moment, um, a moment that really kind of sealed the deal for a lot of Americans and made them become immensely distasteful of, of, of the NBA. I've been talking for a while. You want to ask a question about this or about the, yeah, Joe. So on that chart, wasn't 1980 Magic's first NBA Finals? Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to get to that. Uh, 1980 is Magic's first NBA Finals. Even like Magic Johnson made a big difference. Well, I'll explain why. Um, you couldn't even watch the NBA Finals live in 1980. Um, but it's going to change, right? I mean, if we could continue with this chart, it's going to go up. It's going to go up. And you're right to talk about it. Johnson, yeah. And we have to talk about another player as well. Uh, the title of this lecture is The Great White Hope, so there's someone else we need to talk about also. Other questions? All right, well, let's get to that story. The NBA is in the depths of unpopularity. In the 70s, it's becoming less and less popular. And then the saviors arrive, Larry Bird and Irvin Magic Johnson. The standard line when talking about Bird and Magic is to say that the NBA was going to die had it not been for Bird and Magic. That's an overstatement, all right? The NBA would have eventually figured it out. Uh, David Stern was out there. He was going to take the reins in a few years. The NBA was going to be okay. But what is so remarkable here is that Magic and Bird enter the league in 1980, and they almost instantly transform the image of the league in the American mind. And to a large extent, I'm talking about the white American mind here. The NBA goes from the depths of unpopularity in 1979 into the sporting mainstream um, by the mid-80s, by 1984. And it really has to do with Magic and Bird. I mean, they are the ones who turn the league around. Magic Johnson, a brilliant, immensely charismatic basketball player. His charisma is important. Larry Bird, a brilliant, uncharismatic, but white basketball player. All right, so Magic's charisma and Bird's whiteness matter. This was the winning combination that is going to help the NBA overcome its quote-unquote blackness problem. And there's a paradox here, right? Uh, there's definitely a paradox at work. A sport or a league that is too black is seen as a problem. People tune out. They're not interested. But a league that can be fueled by black versus white competition, black versus white antagonisms, well, that sells in American sports. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. I mean, in this course, we have seen again and again and again how racial tension sells sports. Give me an example. How many can we think of? Yeah. Johnson versus Jeffries. Did she steal your, your thunder? Yeah. Johnson versus Jeffries. All right, Jack Johnson and Jim Jeffries. It's an immensely popular fight, 1910. Rossi. John, uh, Jackie Robinson sold out the Dodgers Stadium. 1947, Jackie Robinson's first year in Major League Baseball is the year more people went to Ebbets Field in that stadium's history, right? We have this one black player in this white-dominated sport. We have racial drama. Yeah. Bill 
Schmeling. Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling. This gets a little complicated because nationalism is also part of the, the equation, but that is a huge, monumental black versus white fight. Any other thoughts? Isaac Murphy and Snapper Garrison, the uh, horse racing jockeys, right? The, they were the biggest show in town in the 1890s. Major Taylor, the great black wheelman of the turn of the 20th century. Cycling was very exciting when it was Taylor against the white cyclists. When Taylor was segregated out of the sport, the popularity of cycling plummeted. Race-based rivalries in sports intrigue. They excite the social stakes of the event are just raised. It becomes much more than a sporting event. So Magic and Bird come into the NBA. It is because of skin color that most Americans think of them as being antithetical, think of them as being polar opposites of each other. Let me make a case, though, for their remarkable similarities. I, mean, I actually think their, their similarities far outweigh their, their differences. They were both... Six foot eight, six foot nine, roughly the same size. Larry Bird played small forward. Magic Johnson played point guard, which was absolutely uh, unheard of at that height in 1980. Neither Bird nor Magic were especially athletic. No incredible speed, no explosive jumping ability, but they were two of the smartest, most creative most competitive players the NBA has ever seen. They demanded everything from their teammates. I mean, tremendous leaders, both of them. They made everyone around them better. Bird and Magic were basketball geniuses. That's exactly what they were. They were basketball geniuses. Both had a court awareness that I have never seen before. They both had the ability to anticipate what was going to happen next before anyone else on the court. I mean, they were mirror images of each other that, that way. This is interesting. Bird and Magic first went head-to-head -head in 1979. The NCAA championship game when Magic Johnson's Michigan State Spartans defeated Larry Bird's then undefeated Indiana State Sycamores. Indiana State was undefeated going into this game, but Magic beat him. To this day, this is the highest rated college basketball game ever. More people watch this college basketball game than any other. And that it's, be, it's because of Bird and Magic. These two great players, one black, one white. I mean, when people talk about the renaissance of college basketball, a sport that was also becoming more unpopular over the course of the 1970s, they point to this game. Magic and Bird repopularized college basketball as well. After this game, these two players, they go their separate ways. They go into the NBA. Magic goes to Los Angeles. Larry Bird goes to Boston. Opposite coasts. This also helps ensure national interest. This is interesting. Larry Bird was actually drafted in 1979. He was drafted before his senior year. He made it very clear, I'm not going into the NBA. I am going to play basketball my senior year in college. The Celtics wanted Larry Bird so badly, they drafted him in 1979. And they said, that's fine. You can sit out a whole year. Um, we'll get you in 1980. You can't do that anymore. You can't draft someone and claim their rights a year later. It's actually known as the Larry Bird rule. Larry Bird's drafting puts a stop to this. But the Celtics, the Boston Celtics, badly wanted Larry Bird. And a lot of people thought it was no coincidence that Boston would use a draft pick for a great white player and wait a whole year. It just seemed to fit with the racial outlook of the city in the 1970s. And so here we need to talk about Boston, okay? And we're going to come back to this backlash story. More than any other American city it was Boston that symbolized the white backlash of the 1970s. Let me remind you, here's a sporting story. The Boston Red Sox were the last Major League Baseball team to sign a black player, right? Elijah Pump C. Green in 1959. A lot of people thought this was indicative of the racial climate in the city. They weren't surprised that it was Boston that went last. 
More to the point, in the 1970s, Boston was the center of the anti-busing movement in the United States. Busing was the single most disruptive social policy of the 1970s. Affirmative action was controversial. Busing was much more controversial. Busing means this. In the 1970s, the federal courts were trying to desegregate schools. Schools were still segregated in places like Boston. They were not segregated by law. There were no Jim Crow laws, but they were segregated because of neighborhood segregation. Right? Blacks in Boston lived on one part of town. Whites in Boston lived on another part of town. Charlotte was another one of the centers of the busing controversy in this country. The federal courts then ordered that black students be bused from black neighborhoods into white neighborhoods. Black students be bused from black schools into white schools in order to engineer integration. These policies sparked intense opposition in Boston, particularly in South Boston, neighborhoods filled with white, Irish, Catholic Bostonians. They objected to the appearance of black students in their schools. This is what it looked like. The buses had police escorts. The people in South Boston lined the street. They gathered at the school As these buses came into their neighborhoods, they threw rocks at the buses. They threw bananas at these buses. They yelled racial slurs at these black students who were, the courts were ordering, um, attend their schools. In South Boston, they did not want these black children coming into their neighborhoods. They objected. This is not fair, they argued. The opposition to busing and the seething racial hatred in Boston at this time was memorialized in this Pulitzer Prize winning photograph in 1976, excuse me, uh, by Stanley Foreman. He titled the photograph, The Soiling of Old Glory. It shows what happens when a black civil rights lawyer happened to walk right in the middle of a white anti busing rally, just accidentally. And this white high school student over here on the left, um, a high school student who was upset that black students were now coming to his school. He objected to that. He took the American flag that he was using as a symbol of protest, and he then used it as a weapon, um, used it to try to hurt Landsmark, the the civil rights attorney. Um, This is Boston in the 1970s. Racial anxieties are high. Racial tensions are very, very high. There is a white backlash movement in Boston in the late 1970s. And so into these anxieties, here comes Larry Bird, right? Um, And Bird immediately turns the Celtics into winners. I mean, Bird is the great white hope. There's all this hype about Larry Bird, and Larry Bird lives up to it. In 1979, the year before Bird was on the Celtics, the Celtics won 29 games. They are one of the worst teams in the league. The next year, with exactly the same roster, but now Larry Bird, they won 61 games. So from 29 to 61, Bird makes everyone better. He makes the Celtics better. They almost made it. All, Bird wins the Rookie of the Year award. They almost made it to the NBA Finals. The Celtics lost to the Philadelphia 76ers in the Eastern Conference Finals. Who was there meeting the 76ers in the Finals but Magic Johnson, also a rookie, and the Los Angeles Lakers? This is just a sports story, but it's a good one. Um, The Lakers were up three games to two in the series. Game six was in Philadelphia. This was a game everyone assumed the Philadelphia Sixers were going to win because the Lakers' great center, Lou Alcindor, now known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he was injured. He had a very serious ankle injury. He was definitely not going to play in game six. It looked like he might not play in game seven. People thought the Sixers were going to win. Magic Johnson, you know, steps into a phone booth, puts on his cape. Uh, Superman goes out on the court. Magic Johnson, Kareem no, is not there. Magic Johnson jumps center in this game. He takes Kareem's place. Magic Johnson plays center. 
He plays power forward. Let's see if I can do this. He plays small forward. He plays shooting guard. Uh, and he plays point guard. He's a 20-year-old rookie. He plays all five positions in game six. And that's his line. 42 points, 15 rebounds, seven assists, three steals. The greatest single game in NBA history, I would argue. I mean, if you look at the stakes and you look at what Johnson did, he carried the Lakers to the NBA championship. If you wanted to watch this game live, which I did, you were out of luck. The NBA was not shown on live television in 1980. These games were tape delayed, and they were shown at 11.30 p.m. after the late night evening news. That's how unpopular the NBA was. But now it's about to get popular because now Bird and Magic are on the scene. We're going to dig a little deeper. Uh, but I'll pause again. You have questions about busing in Boston or Bird versus Magic. Yeah. I think the ironic thing about busing in Boston was Southie, the people that live in Southie, the Irish. Irish, Irish American Catholics, yes, yeah, yeah. Southies. Okay. Were bused to Southie because the, the English land in English didn't want them in Boston. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no rule that says if you yourself, throughout the course of American history, have been subject to discrimination, that you yourself cannot discriminate against others. I mean, this, this, this is a trend in, 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 in American history. And, and part of the anxiety going on here is that in South Boston, in these neighborhoods, these are working class Bostonians who are you know, kind of clinging to their homes and, and, and to their neighborhoods desperately. Um, they don't have a lot of money, and they fear and they are anxious that with the appearance of black students in their schools, that their neighborhoods and their homes are going to go down in, in value. I mean, that definitely helps to explain the, the anti-busing reaction. It doesn't excuse it, but it explains it, I think. Yeah? Like, just to show the opposition to busing, wasn't the guy on the flag, didn't he drop out of school? Um, Joseph Rakes, there's a, great, there's a great book about this uh, photograph called The Soiling of Old Glory. Joseph Rakes, the high school student, is riding the subway the next day, and he sees this photograph in the newspaper, and he says, who is that guy with the flag? And he says, oh, it's me. I mean, he, like, he almost had an out-of-body moment. He, he, he didn't recognize him, himself. He was traumatized by this. He became, he, this high school student, this white high school student, bec becomes the face of racism in the United States. He becomes the face of bigotry in the United States. And there's a, there's a devastating effect on his life, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So when they would bus students in from the black schools, how did they choose which students would go? I'm not exactly sure. I, I mean, I know early on, if you look at how the process played out in places like Little Rock, Arkansas, students were hand-picked by the local NAACP. You have a comment on that? It was largely based, having lived there, it was largely based on parents' choice. Okay, parents' choice. Pa so Parents' choice, because this was going to be very stressful for the kids. So we believe in integration, we believe in desegregation. We're, we, yeah, we're yeah. willing to... But, basically sacrifice our kids to this. But, but, but there were numbers. I mean, in some ways there were, there were quotas and they had to happen. And, and some white students were bused into black schools, but minimal, minimal numbers. Minimal yeah. numbers. Yeah. 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 Do you wanna... The other thing that's important is to remember that the neighborhood adjacent to Southie were Roxbury and Dorchester. I'll say Dorchester. Uh, that probably, yeah. and, and they were, they were really rough. In, the, in those times, they were considered fairly rough. African-American neighborhoods. And, and so, anyway, so, I mean, so, I guess Southeast, to an extent, feel like there's almost, it's a white island with this incre within this increasingly black city. We're going to tenuously, um, aggressively hold on to, to what... With the mob. And because, was, with the mob, because you had Billy Bulger there. And uh, so it was not necessarily a safe place. I want to hear more about the Boston Mafia later. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, Here's what happens. Um, this game is not shown on national TV, but the NBA is about to get incredibly popular. And because now the NBA, they have Magic and Bird, two incredible, creative, competitive players, one white, one black. I can't emphasize that enough. That's the thesis of this lecture. For added drama, they're on opposite coasts, Los Angeles and Boston. These two seem to be worlds apart. From a marketing perspective, the NBA could not have invented it any better. I mean, it was absolutely perfect. And then, as the 1980s progress, here's what happens. The Celtics actually become 
whiter. They become more white as the 1980s progress. In the middle of the 1980s, the NBA was 75% African American. The Boston Celtics were two-thirds white. They were good. I mean, they were great. They were a great team. They were the second best team of the decade. The Lakers were the best team of, of, of the decade. But the Celtics were a racial outlier, as we say now. I think it's telling that when the Lakers would come into Boston to play the Celtics, black Bostonians would say, kick their ass, man. Um, beat the Celtics. We don't like the Celtics. Um, we want you to beat those white boys. And so the magic and bird rivalry, the rivalry between the Lakers and the Celtics, it is incredible basketball. It's great basketball drama. It is also compelling racial drama. It's with bird and magic that we get the renaissance of the NBA because of these racial tensions. How good were they? Well, they were great. Uh, Magic and bird each won the MVP three times. This is an award that you are voted to receive. Bird Celtics were in the NBA Finals five times. They won three NBA titles. Magic's Lakers were in the Finals eight times. They won five NBA titles. They went head-to-head three times. The Lakers won two of the three. From a basketball standpoint, we can have an argument over who was the better player. I submit it was Magic Johnson. I'm happy to have that argument if you want. Um, That's a fun, though not terribly important argument. Um, Let me make the case from our perspective that from the vantage point of the American historian, Larry Bird is the much more significant player. He's the much more historically significant player. Um, And I want to end with this idea. Let me justify my, my choice. We've talked about this before. Let me remind you of this very important idea in our course, Manning Marable's idea of symbolic representation. This is the idea that the single black individual, like the black athlete, represents the larger black collective. A lot, of what we've been, a lot of what we have been talking about in this course is how black athletes were these symbols. They were these symbolic representatives. Joe Lewis, Jackie Robinson, Wilma Rudolph, their achievements were a reflection of what all black Americans wanted, right? They were symbols of integration. Muhammad Ali, he is the symbol. He is the embodiment of the black power movement. When he succeeds, the movement succeeds. Historically speaking, this is the power of the black athlete, that what they do seems to have so much more significance than just that isolated event. This is the power of the black athlete. This is also the burden of the black athlete. They are never just competing for themselves. They have the weight of black America on their shoulders. Think Joe Lewis, for example, perfect example of this. Yeah. For the longest time, Red Auerbach only had one black player, Bill Russell. Bill Bill Russell, a a great black player, who's also, I'll point this out, he's the first black coach in in the NBA. I mean, the the Celtics are ahead of the curve in some ways. Hold on, I'm just going to keep on talking here. Um, Here's what, what happens, though. In the 1980s, this script, this script about symbolic representation, it flips. Uh, people are no longer talking about the symbolism of the black athlete. Suddenly, they're talking about the symbolism of the white athlete. They're focused on Larry Bird. Larry Bird became something bigger than himself. He represented something bigger than himself. Larry Bird in the 1980s was not just a basketball player. He symbolically represented a white male ideal that was on the defensive in the 1980s, as many saw it. A white male ideal that seemed to be losing ground, not just in sports, but in society at large. I mean, whether it's true or not, that was the perception. And so for many white Americans, his photograph kind of gives us a sense of this, particularly for many white Bostonians, Larry Bird is their symbol. Larry Bird is their representative. You know, Larry Bird becomes their great white hope. 
But this works in one more way. I keep saying this. Let's complicate this. Um, Just as Larry Bird was the symbol and the representative of white Americans, he became the subject of scorn for many black Americans. For many black Americans, the idea was Bird was being celebrated by white Americans. He was being celebrated by a white-dominated media well beyond his talent level. Isaiah Thomas, the brilliant guard for the Detroit Pistons, he lost to Bird Celtics in the playoffs in 1987. He was clearly upset. Um, And he sounded off on the media's praise for Larry Bird. Thomas said, Larry is very, very good, but if he were black, he'd be just another good guy. We we wouldn't be celebrating Larry Bird. Um, Give him black skin and he's, he's just average. This comment sparked a firestorm. It got people talking about race. Larry Bird's defenders... They went after Isaiah Thomas. They said, downplaying Bird's abilities. You know what that is? That's reverse racism. That is reverse racism. Bird's critics pointed to Sports Illustrated, Bird on the cover, the best player in the NBA. Bird's critics said all of his MVPs and the way the media anoints him as the best player in the league, it's because he's white. Uh, This is journalistic affirmative action. That's what it is. So we have claims of reverse racism. We have claims of journalistic affirmative action. The nation is talking about race. It's talking about these issues. Larry Bird is the symbol, is the athlete, upon which Americans heap their praise and heap their scorn. And I just want to point this out. This is totally new in American history. Historically, it's the black athlete around which we have had conversations about race, about equality, about civil rights, about freedom. You know, black athletes who dared to appear in white-dominated sports. We talked about those athletes, the Jackie Robinson conversation, the Joe Lewis conversation. Now the conversations about race in the 1980s are about that white basketball player in that green uniform, um, a great white hope in a black in black America's sport. And I'll say this, Larry Bird, he wanted nothing to do with these conversations. He hated talking about race. He said, I have no interest in talking about race. I don't think in terms of color. It doesn't matter what the athlete wants, though, in these situations. I mean, they are the symbols around which our conversations about race, our disagreements about race, they are the symbols around which these conversations orbit. Questions? Yeah. Time use the term reverse racism. Yes. Yeah, that's a term that becomes popular, uh, really with response to affirmative action, particularly a Supreme Court case known as the Backey case in the middle 1970s. This, you know, uh, the, the argument was Martin Luther King Jr. said, "Judge us by the content of our character, not the color of our skin." Well, affirmative action is judging us by the color of our skin. It's, it's, it's not fair. It's, we can have a very interesting conversation about affirmative action. I mean, but the, those are the arguments on both sides. Yeah, so th- that term was used then. Other questions about race, backlash, Larry Bird? Yeah? I think for a long time, Fred Auerbach, Took good players from Holy Cross, Bob Sutton with Bob Cooley, one of the greatest. You're getting all Holy Cross on me, aren't you? Holy Cross. All right, yeah. All right. And he bought, in the next four or five years, he took the top player from Holy Cross and put him on the Celtics. It was an all white team. Well, well uh, Basketball, the NBA, particularly in the 50s and 60s, is very much a local league. I mean, there's no such thing. Basketball isn't on national TV. There's no sense of who's good in California if you're in, in, in Boston. But this changes because of all these media changes we've been talking about. You can now watch Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on TV if you're the Milwaukee Bucks and say, oh, that's the guy we want, you know, as the number one, one draft pick. So basketball is all local in the 50s and the 60s. It becomes national. Um, Except for one guy. Bill Russell? The guy that recruited 
the uh, four Irishmen and a Jew from New York. We, we, well, that's college basketball. We've been talking uh, about that, and we talked about the reasons why Frank McGuire is able to, to bring in the New York players. Yeah. Other questions or other thoughts? No one wants to argue back and say Larry Bird was way better than Magic? Is that what you're going to I'm not going to argue either way. All right. But one of the things I remember... It doesn't matter, does it? One of the things I remember... I was a Boston fan, so... You know. Okay, whatever. Uh, one of the things I used to remember reading in the press, though, was they, they'd always talk about how hard a worker Bird was. Yes. And Lunch I remember, pale guy. Uh, yeah, right. and I don't remember reading that as much about Magic. More more natural ability idea. And so I think that probably... I think this plays into our ideas about race, right? I mean, Bird's success is due to his work ethic. It's due to his white work ethic. Magic's success perhaps just has to do with natural ability. I'm arguing that, I mean, those are the two players in which you should not make that comparison. Bird and Magic, neither of them have particular athleticism. I mean, they, they have athleticism, clearly, but not explosive athleticism. In some ways, in a basketball standpoint, they're the same guy. Um, but it's interesting that we think about them as polar opposites, and it's just because of pigmentation. It's because of skin color. Yeah? Uh, is, is it accurate that, uh, unlike basketball and baseball, football was integrated much earlier? Well, uh, the NFL is desegregated right after World War II, so it's only, I mean, it all, it all happens within a five-year period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, baseball in 47, football in 46, actually, uh, the NBA in 1950, yeah. Yeah, way in the back. Yep. Are there other historians who would say that race did not play this big of a factor in the bird magic story? Yeah, during this time period with basketball. Are there sure there are always historians? There are commentators who would are. I mean, I, I, I can think of a few people, uh, media commentators, if they were sitting in this lecture, would say that I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. That this has nothing to do with with race. I mean, what explains the popularity of the Cooney Holmes fight? Um, you know, Holmes, an unpopular champion against Cooney, a not very good challenger, other than than race. I mean, it's it's it, it's I'm staking my historian credentials on the argument that racial anxieties is almost everything in these situations. Look, are are Magic and Bird just good because they're black and white? No, they're fabulous to the top 10 basketball players in NBA history. But the fact that they're black and white, that propels the league into the stratosphere. Actually, it doesn't propel the league into the stratosphere. It It propels the NBA into the mainstream. The guy who propels the NBA into the stratosphere... Oh, there he is, Michael Jordan, um, almost literally the stratosphere. Uh, we will talk about Jordan, his c- cultural significance in one week. Next time, though, the NFL, another league that becomes popular. Uh, we will discuss that then. <laughs>